Ladies and gentlemen, welcome, welcome, welcome. I am your host, Adam Steele, and joining me this week is a very special guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. John Brown. Hello. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, if you are not aware of John Brown, what are you doing if you lived in a hole? But uh, John is from Monuments and Flux Conduct and Riffhard and does a lot of things in the chugga chugga metal world that's offensive (laughs) is it now (laughs) (laughs) i'm just happy you didn't call it gent actually well i do i do try and avoid the word gent because it's uh yeah it, it, it 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 sums things up rather poorly i think it doesn't explain the genre at all does it really no i'd actually say that it explains deathcore a little bit better yeah (laughs) I mean, it it explains Meshuggah, but not a lot else. <laughs> I don't actually, I actually don't think it does, because obviously Meshuggah is a lot of that single note sort of, you know, riffy kind of repet- uh, repetitive sort of stuff. Whereas when I think of Gen, I think of like that really metallic double power chord, you know, the the yeah. root and the fifth twice. That's kind of that being par muted, and you get that sort of. 1.6 kilohertz attack that's to me is what gent is usually with a bad clean part underneath <laughs> so <laughs> so yeah we're gent yeah say. <laughs> <laughs> so coming up tonight firstly in this week's news we have stuff from two notes in victory uh eventide boss have got a new octava and so we'll have electro harmonics strymon have got a new thing uh there's a guitar made of concrete yes concrete that sounds and sick yeah, thought you might like that. And a couple of things in Behringer Corner. So without further ado, let's roll the intro. There we go. New intro, ladies and gentlemen. I filmed, not filmed, I, I recorded the music for that last night. And it was a, John can't even hear it. <laughs> That's the funny thing. Um, I heard something coming from your Oh, coming from my headphones. Yeah. yeah. Um, it probably sounded better than the actual track. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those things. I just, for some reason last night, was possessed to re-record the, uh, the intro music. Because to my ear, it just didn't sound very good. And... Then I realized halfway through, I, I grabbed my lovely guitar, the PRS, and realized that most of my recording gears at the studio, and then looked around and thought, what do I have? Uh, I'm currently, to my shame, using a Behringer UM2. I'm using the worst interface, possibly since the one that I had 20 years ago. It's a pile of crap. Did you have a Sound Blaster or did you by any chance? No, I was. I, I saved up, I had a Tascam, us uh, yes. 422 it had faders on and everything but it was yep. crap it didn't even do phantom power it was just terrible uh but it's, it's funny you say that but the behringer i i think we used it for some of the riff hard material at the beginning the um2 the really really cheap plasticky one like no, the, actually, it was. It had four channels. So yeah, it might have just been the upgrade. The four hundred four HD. I've got one of those in the studio. And that thing's fantastic. That's really good. The UM two okay. is awful. It doesn't even have its own drivers. It doesn't have ACO drivers. It's that bad. Oh, so you're like using ICO for all or something? Yep. And it was so, <laughs> but it's literally all I had. And I tried plugging the guitar straight into the the jack input on the front of it, and thought, oh, this is terrible. And then had to root around and found one of these. It's an Orchid Electronics DI box, which is actually really good. Uh, but it's got no pad on it, so I was clipping the interface. <laughs> uh, yeah. just like, I do ah. that with pads on. <laughs> oh yeah, well you you would do, wouldn't you? Ah <laughs> uh, yeah, just hitting too hard, too angry. That's what it is. <laughs> and that's without a boost pedal, just sixty dB of spike. Just yes. ah. <laughs> <laughs> There's actually a little man screaming inside those pickups. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. And yet, so I did that, and I tracked the bass, and then I used Superior Drummer Three, and I made it work. It was a proper Bear Grylls moment of you know improvise, adapt, overcome. And it really is amazing what you can do with the most limited gear if you are hard-headed enough. 
Exactly. And yeah, I was playing it kind of, you know, just do, 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 and I thought, what would John Brown do? And I smacked the hell out of it. It sounded great. <laughs> and what did you, it's funny because um, like the first, it was technically Monuments, but it was before it was a live band. Right. Um, and I recorded the guitar directly into the microphone input of the sound card on my motherboard. Wow. Yes. Into Amplitude. Yes. <laughs> um, and it was truly awful. <laughs> I bet it didn't sound bad though, because you just absolutely chugged it up. <laughs> it was it was more just that it was really noisy, you know. Because right. I had a, I had like you know my jack cable going to one of those six point five to three point five yep. inch adapters. Yeah, I remember them. And then into, <laughs> and then into the, uh, the microphone the, input. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and then it was just clipping all over the place, but. I still managed to get something out of it. So I think it's possible to get something usable out of most gear. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We talk about new and shiny gear all the time, don't we? But you can make whatever you have work. Generally, uh, yes. There are obviously certain things that might not, but that's it's normally like the last 1% to 5% of the sound. Yeah. So it's, it's it depends on how ridiculous you want to be. I think that's probably best way to put it yeah i mean the other thing for me is i I, uh, I had to get creative because being a complete idiot i forgot to bring my eye lock back from the studio and that's got most <laughs> of my plugins on it see i was about to say then because you're like reaper jesus <laughs> <laughs> why seems, do you need that's... an eye lock <laughs> oh no the, the two are completely they they work together perfectly well i'm like slate everything and uh i use i, I use a lot of stuff that's on eye lock um but it just so happens like reaper's the vehicle for me what i do inside that is generally third party plugins let's be honest uh, but it means that i can sit down at cubase or pro tools or whatever and as long as the same plugins are available to me i mix the same and it yep. it, it means that you know it is what it is it's like if i took some nice outboard of my own to a different studio i would just patch it in and carry on it's a similar deal yep. but yeah i, I didn't I didn't have it, and I was like, "Oh crap! Uh, what do I do?" <laughs> so I ended up with using the PRS supermodels from Waves, uh, which sounded okay. And I was going to use Mammoth for the bass because Mammoth's awesome, and that's on iLock as well. So I ended up uh, using oh god, what did I use? I can't even remember now. I think it was a guitar amp that I just used some rather drastic EQ on. I find that I use guitar amp on bass a lot as well, actually, for the top end mostly. Yes. Yeah, but don't you just then, with the, the DI separately, just filter it and then just boost the crap out of it? It's um, it's actually the DI for the guitar amp. It's the uh, Pod XT for the bottom end. Because ah. it's quite solid. Yeah. So the, the I, I don't know why. I still use the Pod XT nearly every single day. Um, <laughs> for your it penance just, it's just one of those things that just works i know that i can plug it in and it's going to work do you know what i mean yeah like a piece of gear that cost me what it cost me 200 pounds in 2007 second hand and it's I, i've still got it it's what four, 13 years old since i've had it so it's like yeah it's getting on a little bit i might have to get another one actually i'm scared that it's going to break <laughs> yeah let's just put a little bit of a delay on your audio so it looks like it syncs up with your mouth there we go Ah, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I was going to use a Kazrog plugin. I can't remember what I used in the end. Uh, but yeah, I made it work. And then, uh, yeah, look around for the Kazrog plugins and everything for the master in. And there we go. Job done. New intro. No eye lock. Uh, no decent interface. You can make it work if you really want. Does it sound better than the one before? It does, funnily enough. <laughs> and I had all the nice plugins. So what does that tell you? Um that you don't necessarily need the nicest of gear. Oh, yeah, there you go. But the nicest of gear is still really nice. <laughs> shiny stuff. Shiny, shiny. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, someone in chat, Freezing Irish, is saying, like, your recent Valve State review of the the, is it the VS100. Uh, it's actually the 8100. So the VS100 Eight. was actually the second edition of it, Ah. which I think is pretty terrible from what I remember. <laughs> They somehow made them sound um, progressively worse, didn't they? I mean, that tends to happen, doesn't it? Like, you think you can make something better, and then you go back to it and make some tweaks, and generally it's worse. It's the same with mixing, isn't it? Yeah. 
Actually, I, I generally find that my mixes get better each time, but that's because of different reasons, like me plowing in like a bull in a china shop. Uh, I've actually never had that. I always find that the first mix is generally the one that sounds the best. Really? Yeah, generally, yeah. And it's uh, whenever I've done it more than, in fact, actually, not completely, Gnosis was the second mix. So uh -huh. I still prefer the first mix, though. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, like for me, I always think that it's better when you've done it the first time. Because then you make like the little adjustments that you're just hearing because you've over listened to it. You know what I mean? Yes. Oh, God. Yeah. No, I, I do tend for the second revision to sit down with a pad and paper and make a big list and then just go, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but someone there that said they saw me on the Fell Silent uh, Enish Shikari tour. Nice. Wow, that's going back a few years. That's 12 years ago. Wow. Yeah. I was still young. Now I'm old. <laughs> God, I, I don't think I'd even been in a super aggressive metal band at all 12 years ago. Uh, trying to think, because I did a few few shows with a proper jig -a -jig -a -jig -a kind of band. Probably around then. Uh, yes. um, 2006 to 2008 sort of time. Yeah, 2008, 2009 maybe. I just shaved my head for some stupid reason. I remember that. I've been growing my hair longer than you, and I swear it's only like... <laughs> A tenth of the, a tenth of the length. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I started growing my hair really sixteen years ago, but I've shaved it all off twice. So, keep putting myself back just in a moment of. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I do not shoot. I do not suit short hair. I look like a criminal. <laughs> yes, uh, it is time for. The news, the news. So we go over to this. And this is our lovely uh, display of the news. And we'll start with something that is very relevant to me, because why not? It's my show. <laughs> so um, two notes have uh, buddied up, as the news says, with Victory Amps for a suite of their virtual cabinets. And I should know, I made them. And they floating. Look, well, it's awesome. <laughs> I'm 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 proud of it. Um the, it, it took me a lot of work. Why is why is it not showing? That is really weird. There we go. Um that's that's really weird. Every time I uh click on Chrome, it decides to not show everybody. That's really weird. Huh. But yes, um the um there there are 20 speaker captures have been released for the uh, copper and sheriff that's in 412s 212s 112s and it's front and back and everything with 16 different microphones and it sent me absolutely insane i can imagine 16 mics yeah and they're all in multiple positions as well front and back of the cabinet because it's all done with a particular system mm -hmm. so you can't just okay, pick, yeah you can't just pick your favorite one and just go, there you go. Yeah, yeah it's on that. Is, is it like the, um, what's it called? The wall of sound plugin. Yes. Where you can just move stuff around. Uh, that's probably why it sent you insane, actually. You need to get yourself a dynamount, lad. Well, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's not quite that. It's um, for the two note stuff. I mean, there is a bit of an NDA on it, but it, there is there are specific things that you have to do, and a dynamount wouldn't really speed it up. But dynamount's awesome for like general capture of things, and I would definitely like to have a dynamount myself. But as it is, I've got arms and I've got stands, so <laughs> I make do. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you do it enough times, and I mean that says there are twenty cabinets, and there are twenty cabinets that have been released, but there are more to come. And uh, that's no big secret. If you follow Victory at all, you will see that, oh, there's the copper, there's the sheriff. Where are the other types? Because they do other amps as well, which are rather well known, like the uh, the Kraken. That's that's not there at all. So you, you don't need to be a genius to uh, work out that they're coming soon. And so, I've actually never tried a Victory amp. No, you absolutely should. Although... Yeah, I mean, the Kraken, it's somewhere between a JCM 900 and a 5150. And I think you'd like it. I might, 
I don't like either of those albums. Really? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but I'm sure I'll like it because it's it's the old Cornford lot, isn't it? It that's is. It's Martin Kidd and his are. team. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So obviously Cornford are gr- fantastic, but yeah, I've just never tried one. I've heard one in person. I thought it sounded good. Yeah. Well, yeah, the the Kraken especially has got a switch called the Focus Switch. I think that would be something that you'd gel with because it kind of shifts the low end response and makes it super dry and tight. That now you're talking my language. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> dry and tight. John Brown's favorite. Everybody. <laughs> There's a pun in there, isn't there? There is somewhere. I'll let the pun make itself. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, um, I did see the super chat. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for the ten euros. Thank you for giving me my uh, my money back. <laughs> um, Michelle, for anyone who's not aware, was at Forty Two Gear Street, and he is uh, a friend of the channel, and he was the organizer there. And he did a great job. He did an amazing job. But yeah, there was a bit of a joke going in our group chat that. Um, to guarantee coming back 42 gear street three which is something i definitely want to do uh you had to pay some money to michelle as the organizer so i just for a laugh just to make him laugh i sent him 10 euros on paypal <laughs> i've still got his uh i've still got some of his chips uh, i have as well yeah we obviously didn't make enough videos we'll have to go back <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yes. all right, i'm gonna have to check out those victory cabs then is that what you're saying Yes, I think you will like the Victory Cabs, uh, especially the Sheriff. It's made with the G12H Anniversary, uh, which okay. is a surprisingly good speaker. I didn't know what to make of them originally, but it, it's kind of... Imagine the Vintage 30 without that 1K bark. Okay. So it Would kind you, of, How does it compare to like a greenback? Um, it's, it is a greenback but it's a heavy greenback it's got a bit more of an extended top end and a bit more of a stiff response so okay. is it higher wattage than the, the greenback yeah so the, the the greenback everyone knows is the 25 watt which is the medium yeah uh, the g12h is a 30 watt with the big heavy magnet so as okay. you, uh, when you feed it quite a lot of power it doesn't buckle and give up as easily it's got much more of a stiff kind of force to it Okay, which I'll have to check it out. Yeah, so yeah, it's a greenback with a bit more top end and a stiff response. But then, yeah, there are more that will be coming rather soon. Yes. So, moving on. Uh, it does actually mention my name in here, but yeah, whoever's... Uh, just to finish before I do move on. Uh, whoever's written this article is, is, like, not the most super aware of, like, really, really expensive mics. Because like they've they've name checked the super premium Neumann U eighty seven, which it, it is. They're what two and a half grand. They've not mentioned the U sixty seven that was in there, which was ten grand, or the U forty seven, which is thirty grand. <laughs> yeah, talk it's about the U eight. It's because the U eighty seven is like the most known, I guess. Yeah, it's true. Uh, yeah, I mean, no one's going to go out and buy a sixty seven or a forty seven unless you know exactly what it is. That's very true. Mm. And more so if it's vintage as well. <laughs> yes. Um, so I've been looking at vintage mics this week and then looking at prices and going, nope. Ah, well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a rabbit hole, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I know exactly what I would buy if I had infinite money, but then I look at it and go, well, well, I could I could pay for my daughter to exist for the next several years or I could buy a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm. Uh, I'd say choose the mic. Yeah, I nearly did. <laughs> <laughs> She'll be fine. No, uh, She'll be f- so um, that's behaving really strangely. But yes, um, Eventide uh, have pulled out all the stops with the new black hole reverb pedal, and we know all about this, don't we? Because our friends at Forty Two Gear Street have released loads of videos on this. Yeah, did, yeah. Did and... you make a black hole video? I did, yes, with Mr. Jamie Humphreys and I had to cut a lot of the video out. <laughs> <laughs> I would have yeah, left, no, uh, left it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a, like with um, the other pedal that we did, the Juliana. Yes. Um, there was, this has so many options in it. Mm. Um, so obviously the first time that you try a pedal, remembering all those options is usually, uh, you know, difficult. Mm. Um, but that pedal sounded really, really good. I've actually never tried anything Eventide. Right. Ever. Oh, I love Eventide. 
Um, I at Real World Studios, I tried their H three thousands. Uh, you've got to be a like programming nerd unless you just use a preset and just leave it the hell alone. Uh, yeah. But the H three thousand, um, you're a Steve Vai fan, right? Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. So stuff like Ballerina twelve twenty four, that kind of thing, that's an Eventide classic sound. Yeah, it's that's just a harmonizer thing, right? Yeah. So that was, but that was like the Eventide H three thousand. It wasn't a harmonizer that unit, but it was like you could program it to do anything if you were a maths genius, and so you could do <laughs> that. And Sounds like my old Digitech twenty one twenty that I had. <laughs> yeah. So imagine an ultra like high end version of that. That's even tied for you. So that that classic eighties and nineties wacky sounds, all even tied units. Yeah. Yeah, I need to try some more even tied for sure. Because it yeah. sounded awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I think you'd get on well with an H nine. Because an H9 is basically the old H3000 from the 80s and 90s without the silly price tag and with a like a USB and an interface so you can actually do things graphically rather than punching numbers into the pad on the front because, my God, however they managed that. Not, <laughs> not cases. I think that people had more patience in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Just just sit up all night with a with a dube and an H three thousand and just keep pushing the numbers till something works. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean that. I mean it's no different. Imagine what it was like with recording when you had to cut tape apart. Oh God, <laughs> to edit. <laughs> yeah, I've said I I um I've said before on the channel I I roughly learned in my first year of of studying how to do editing on tape and razor and all that kind of stuff. Never again. Jesus, yeah. now that I know exactly what it took and what I can do without it, I'll just hit S for split every time. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, but yeah, so the Eventide. Uh, let's move on to something that came out uh, today. Uh, Boss have announced the new Octave pedal, the OC5, and I definitely want one of these. Don't know about I, you. I, well... In Monuments and Flux Connaught, there's a lot of clean parts that are played in twice, both. Mm. And sometimes it can be um, just two octaves, sometimes three. Yeah. And it's pretty difficult to find an octava that doesn't suck. Right. I think you might be interested in this then, because this has got a polyphonic mode now, the new poly mode, and it does an octave up as well as down. Okay, that sounds like it could be quite cool. Actually. Yeah. So um, the demos I've seen of it in polyphonic mode, it tracks surprisingly well. Uh, but then you can stick it on vintage mode and get that weird glitchy OC2 kind of thing going on. People want that? Some people seem to want that. <laughs> I mean, hey, it's got that royal blood kind of thing, you know, if that's what you want. Yep. Uh, but from what I've heard, this one actually tracks really well with bass as well, which, hello, yes, please. <laughs> I mean, minus one octave that tracks properly on a low bass part, that can make the floor rumble. That's, it can. Yeah. yeah. That, I, I like how it's got the direct out and the output so that you can split your bass channels. Yes. It's like a, it's like a POG, mm. if you've ever used one of those. And oh, then you yeah, can just yeah. send the sub out and then just have it as an extra sub on your, on your you know, direct yeah. to the PA yeah. as an extra sub channel, which would be pretty cool. I mean, when we can gig again <laughs> yeah what i would probably do as a bass guy is i would i tend to try and use two amps where possible a cleaner amp for the low end and a grittier amp for the top end and i would probably use this as my splitter and use the output to the gritty top on sorry no the output to the low end so i've got the sub on the clean low and it doesn't yeah. have to affect the top then and i, I can just rattle the walls really cool I'm just trying to i'm just trying to imagine you right now carrying eight Two eight by tw tens. Two two by tens. That's where it's at. <laughs> See, that's smart. Mark base ones by any chance? No, Zilla. Oh, you've got the Zilla. Yeah, I yeah. always forget about that. Yeah. Yeah. Any cab that I have, it's probably a Zilla. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, there's 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 more of them on the way as well. It's getting silly. <laughs> but yeah, 130 US dollars. That seems quite reasonable for one of these. I was expecting more of a Wazacraft kind of price, but. Obviously not. That's great. Yeah, that's probably going to be well, like a hundred quid then, hundred and ten. Yeah, I hope so. So yeah, and it's not going to be long before you see them as street price, quite reasonable, because all the guitarists will go out and buy one, and half of them will go, "Oh, I don't like this." 
Yeah. And <laughs> the reason they'll say that is because of this next news article, and that is another uh, pitch shifter that's been released this week. The Electro Harmonics Pitchfork Plus has finally come out. The um, It's a polyphonic pitch shift from the competition. And that got released this week as well. So, yes. Uh, electro- I've never tried an Electro Harmonics pedal either. Really? Have you ever tried a Pog? No? Well, I mean, yeah, our um, bass player Swanee had a Pog, but I've never physically tried it. Right. From what I remember. Now, the Pitchfork was always a weird one for me because the Pitchfork was loosely based on a Digitech Whammy. Uh, yeah. But the Plus, if it's polyphonic, will be more like the Pog in terms of tracking. And I've always liked the Pog because I've always felt that their tracking was relatively tight compared to the Boss Octavas. And yeah, even Pog tight- is actually really good on bass. Mm. That yeah, that's the thing that with the the angle I'm coming from uh, from. But then the pitchfork, you can have an expression pedal attached, uh, so you use it like a Digitech whammy. And so if you've got the kind of board where you've got uh, multiple effects that all use expression pedals, you can common link them together. Uh, I've seen that done on several boards now. Uh, where you can have an expression pedal that's linked to the expression input of several pedals, but if you've only got one switched on at a time, then it it becomes the expression for that pedal. Very clever. Interesting. Very clever, yeah. Yeah, I've seen uh, Dan from the Gig Rig do that a couple of times for people's setups, and it, it, it at first I went, you can't do that. Oh, you can do that. Interesting. Yes. Well, that would work. Yeah. yeah. However he's managing to do it, it's very, very clever indeed. But yeah, this thing's got two outputs as well, so it seems to be a common thread. Uh, this thing will do up to three octaves either way, though, so the tracking had better be good because you can do that real Tom Morello kind of thing very easily. Yeah. But then you can go all the way up to like upsetting dogs. <laughs> what's that? What's that third output up there? So you got the main, the orcs, and then the X. X. extra. Um, <laughs> It could be an external on-off of some kind, maybe. Oh, EXP input for... Oh, interesting. So the expression pedal can take CV input, so it can take constant voltage from something like a synth, as well as expression. Uh, Where's the multiple outs? Doesn't seem to say anywhere about the EXT. Might be an external switch. Yeah, that's kind of why I'm thinking. Bless you. Excuse me. Bless you. Thank you. Oh, I'm allergic to everything. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But yeah, talking of uh, the great Tom Morello, Dunlop has released a Tom Morello signature crybaby. And seeing as though Tom Morello pretty much just uses a normal crybaby, it sounds like a normal crybaby. That's quite an interesting message on the side of it, isn't it? The yeah. top one. Uh, yes, you don't need a weapon. You don't need a weapon, you were born one. <laughs> it when may you as well say one. you are an absolute chuffing weapon. <laughs> 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 yeah, just rename it to you absolute weapon. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, sometimes history needs a push. <laughs> Ooh. I absolutely love that band though. Oh, I do. And Audio Slave as well, one of my favourites. So good. Uh, one live stream I did earlier this year was I played the entire of the first Rage Against the Machine album on bass, start to finish, no stops. And they blocked it. The gits. Of course they did. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, yeah. Like, the, the machine, the machine raged, raged against me. <laughs> it's like, mm. well, damn it. So yeah, um, that's going to be available for $185. I can get a regular crybaby for 20 used. Blah. That's that's awful. But yeah, apparently it's some special version. It's got a hot pots potentiometer in it, uh, which means something apparently. But I'm guessing the spray of the logos on the side costs $80 or whatever it is. That's where the it's premium that red, goes. It's the red star on the top, man. Yeah. <laughs> It's expensive. No, to be fair though, it might be it might be tweaked to Tom's sort of craziness. Yeah, I guess so. 
talking. Well, about... I want to try it. It's made me want to try it just from the text on the side of it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so moving on, uh, the Strymon Night Sky is supposed to be revealed today. Apparently, there's been a picture of it, and uh, at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. E, uh, Strymon are doing some sort of demo on their Facebook page of the new Night Sky Reverb. Uh, so it's kind of like a blue sky, but it's not got a screen on it. That much I know because I saw a picture of it before, but I can't find the... Oh, there it is. No, that's that's a joke picture that somebody made. Um, That's that's a, a meme picture of uh, the new Strymon <laughs> tuner called the Bluefin tuner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got loads of different modes like the TU2 and the uh, <laughs> Polytune Mini. <laughs> and the Auto-Tune knob, amazing. Yes, fantastic. <laughs> so this is just like a smaller version of the Blue Sky, basically, with probably different options. Probably I th- darker, I would imagine. I think so. It, yeah, Night Sky, yeah, I would think it would be darker. But it did have some functions on that seemed rather simplified compared to a blue sky. It seemed like all the controls were on the top rather than being in menus and submenus, which for some guitarists I can imagine that would be a much more appealing thing to have the controls actually at your fingertips. Again, at a Strymon, it's another pedal that I've not owned, but it's the, um, use the timeline. I think it was right. Um, on the last records. Um, and yes, yeah, the old line six guys, all from right. what I gather. Ah. So that's why the effects are good, and that's probably why I've still got my Pod XT. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's probably all the same effects. It's funny, the same designers that pass through companies, you do tend to latch on, don't you? It's like, yeah, they have a certain style. It's almost like a band, isn't it? Yeah, it's like in terms of guitars, I seem to be a massive Grover Jackson fan, and I didn't realise it until very recently, because uh, I've got a bass that's an absolute favourite of mine, and I, my original one of them, and I really regret selling it, was the Nam Show prototype. I don't know how I ended up with it, but um, I sold it and I got an, a, a production model recently. And it says on the headstock designed by Grover Jackson, uh, underneath where it says Washburn. And I was like, well, damn, no wonder I like this. <laughs> So it's you funny. You just latched onto him. <laughs> yes, and like the certain pedals that I like that um, from like way huge, and then there's the Line Six. I think it's the DL Four. It's all George Trips, and he's another guy whose stuff I really like, and I didn't know it was him for a long time. So yeah, it's amazing that that these things. The more I find out about this industry, the more threads that I put together. Yeah. So quite interesting that they managed to keep it all separate. Yes. Absolutely. But yeah, the so from the, the the wonderful to the weird, the Tula microphone. There we go. The all-in-one mobile recording solution that fits in your pocket. Looks a bit like a shaving device. Yeah. But apparent, <laughs> apparently this has been made by the guys from Soyuz Microphones. And the reason this caught my eye is it's a battery-powered um, portable recorder that is also a usb podcasting mic which interesting I thought, yeah that seemed really interesting because you could take it with you as like a field recorder and record interviews and then plug it straight back in with usb and transfer the footage and then same day use that as a uh, podcast mic so you can travel light i do like traveling light wherever possible so yeah. it's 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 kind of similar to what zoom do in a way yeah um, but that actually looks pretty cool. Is it? Um, so it lasts twelve hours on a single charge. How does it save the files if you use it as a, you know, field recorder? Uh, I would imagine there's an SD card slot. I can't find that detail, but it does do forty-eight K sixteen bit, which oh, is, 16 bit. Yeah, oh, I would have much me. preferred twenty-four bit, but yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> You can get decent enough resolution out of 16-bit if the world isn't imploding. Yeah, I mean, it's if it's good, because, I mean, the Atari radar was limited to 16-bit and 48 kilohertz. That's the Atari radar one. All right. And it sounded really good. Like, that was going back 10 years now, though. But mm. generally, you don't really want to use 16-bit files as nearly everything is in 24-bit now, apart from CDs, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, Max is in chat and says, hello, C friends. 
<laughs> mm. Hi, Max. <laughs> It, it Hello, is, Max. It is all right. We are allowed to swear on this podcast. I am not particularly bothered. Okay. And we I'll have remember that the chains are off. <laughs> We've managed to go for the last thirty minutes, so now YouTube shouldn't have an absolute shit fit. Because um, <laughs> um, I've been reading up on the terms of like monetization and all that kind of stuff, and they tend to demonetize you apparently for swearing at the beginning of a video. It's in the first thirty seconds, but my uh, is intro is is. Uh, 17 seconds so i only have the last 13 seconds <laughs> <laughs> that's what she said <laughs> ah yes hey, that was coming <laughs> that's what she said and that's what she said <laughs> oh chains are off now boys but yes um from that to something that that i think is possibly overpriced is di boxes are not a particularly interesting news topic but Lightning Boy are a company that have caught my attention recently because they do these things like modular valve distortion units. And the reason this caught okay. my attention is it's basically a big bog-off transformer in a box. Uh, and apparently it's designed to have the transformer character. So if you're tracking something that sounds a bit sterile, like a, a bass or something, then you might want to get something like this to get some character out of your tracks. I think it depends on what the overall what what it is you're looking for really because obviously if you're recording a guitar with the plans to reamp it then something like that to me doesn't seem like it's the right choice. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, you, you just want something as transparent as possible, but that transformer does look pretty cool. Yeah, it looks pretty beefy and it's a eight pin transformer so there's a lot going on. It's $169 which is not cheap. But it's also not bad in comparison to stuff like the red GI. Yes, which is hideously overpriced for what it is, in my or humble the, opinion. Or the, or the Creation Audio MW1, which I would consider the best DI ever made. Mm. Um, currently, I'll, anyway. I'll have to bring you a couple of DI boxes that I've got from Latvia, from a company called Simpleway, which are like uh, completely no op amps, no transformers, completely like high headroom for days. I think they might. Do you clip it? Have you ever clipped it? Uh, with with the padding, which I don't actually hear the pad, which is another good thing. Never clipped it. All right, I'll check it out. Yeah, because I mean, a lot of a lot of DI boxes, the pad really negatively affects the tone, doesn't it? It really does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but it depends on the design. Some of them, like some of these, it, it, it's a completely transparent pad, and so it's definitely worth checking out for Mister Chug Chug Chug. Like. <laughs> You could clip anything, but yeah. Also, I've got the best uh, reamp boxes, arguably on the planet, arriving on my doorstep within the next couple of days. So, is it an MW one? No, the reamp boxes are from Signal Art Electronics. Uh, they're completely transparent, but they come out at something like plus four dBU or something stupidly loud compared to the radial stuff that just is no never loud enough. Y y actually, yeah. You ever noticed? Yeah, actually, coming to think of it, yeah, yeah, I've noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, you always have to have a boost of some kind with the radial, even with the top end radials. Yeah, because I've got a 500 series X amp, and I did think it was a little bit quiet, and I had to drive the signal. Yeah. Going into it, I, I've never found a reamp box that can match the level. Like, um, uh, I've got a Les Paul with Juggernauts in it, and if I just AB that with any reamp box, it just they're nowhere near. Uh, but these new signal art ones are hot enough and don't have a mid hump like the radial ones do. So hopefully, fingers crossed. Yeah, we'll have to do some videos on that, bio. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll give it a go. Why not? Yes. Um, but yes, apparently uh, this is a thicker sound. Um, I've also got a Groove Tubes uh, Ditto DI box if we ever want to do that kind of sound. Because uh, it's a big thing with two valves, big fat transformers, beast of a thing. Uh, if you want DI box with character, that thing's got it in, in spades. Uh, it's, right. it's got no pad, though. It's got, like, gain. It's got up to 30 dB of gain on it. <laughs> have you ever tried to put it in front of an amp? Uh, thinking about it, I don't think I have. Huh. Might make a cool drive pedal, like yeah. a volume boost. Yeah, it is like a yeah. It's twelve AU sevens in there, and it you can get ah, right, you, yeah. But you can get some nice valve grit out of it because thirty dB a drive on those valves is it's a fair whack. 
you could probably put some 12AX7s in there as well. They're just the lower gain version of that. Yeah. Um, hello to Scott from Chernobyl Studios in chat, by the way. Yes, uh, mate of mine, Scott. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Now, this news article made me think of you, John. Uh, heavy guitars. This guitar is made literally of concrete. You're not getting okay. you're not getting a much heavier guitar in the literal. I can't see it. <laughs> Let's see it. Ah, there we go. I don't know what's up with OBS today. Um, it, it's probably because I'm running a, a weird new version of OBS. I'm using OBS 26, which isn't officially out yet. Um, I think that looks sick. I really like the finish on it, but yeah, it looks like it looks like a kitchen counter. Well, it's been made <laughs> made from a kitchen counter essentially. Um, it was left to cure for ten months uh, in a mold uh, before being ground down. It weighs unloaded nineteen pounds. So, like that. Two less that balls. That weighs more <laughs> than this Fender amp, I think. No, the Fender amp's like thirty-three pounds, isn't it? But that's still ridiculously heavy. That is, yeah, for a guitar, that is that is almost double the weight of a Les Paul. That I is... can imagine it sounds pretty damn good, though. Mm -hmm. That's got to sustain. If if the bridge is properly screwed into the body, that's going to sustain forever. I have to get one of Dirk Bagley's aluminium necks on it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. That would actually be probably really solid. Tone, tone for days, but it need like a custom mounting frame so that you sit down and like scoot it over you so it doesn't touch your leg. <laughs> Otherwise, you're losing <laughs> feeling in those legs pretty quickly. <laughs> so yeah, if it weighs 16 pounds by itself, that means that guitar must be what? 22 23 pounds if not a little bit more yeah, including the leg uh, including the neck leg yeah the neck yeah guitars have legs now ladies and gentlemen my brain is just falling out of my ear but yeah i mean <clears throat> this that sounds like a really cool idea to get a uh a guitar made out of concrete although what i might do if i was to do anything like this would be uh put chambers in the uh in the mold so that the back is all chambered so it doesn't weigh a stupid amount well, I mean, technically, Aristides have already done this with their Arium sort of technology. Yeah, the kind of liquid wood. <clears throat> the liquid wood. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, it's just that their um, their the Arium has air pockets in it, so that's uh, why it resonates so much. But I'm guessing that if you did that in concrete, you'd probably get a similar sort of effect. You know, like breeze block hmm. sort of might resonate in a different way, but. It yeah. sounds. It seems like it's a rabbit hole to go down. Can you buy this guitar, or is it just that someone's done it? Uh, it's just that someone's done it. Um, but apparently, they used a build-your-own guitar kit and just went to town. Interesting. But yeah, if if I could get a, like a three D print of a mold made and get a tow man build your own guitar kit, I'm sure I could make guitars out of all sorts of weird, wonderful. Like, have a look at what resins you can have and end up like because you've seen guitars. Uh, that are made out of like packet noodles and stuff. Oh right, yeah, of course. I mean, yeah, they're just epoxy resin, aren't they? Yeah, kind of similar to those river tables and stuff like that. Mm. Um, but yeah, again, the problem with epoxy resin and acrylic is it just weighs so much. Yeah, when you get to the thickness that you need. But saying that, then if you did it at the thickness of say like a, a black machine guitar, yeah, because then obviously it's more rigid than a piece of wood. Yes, then. You can cut down a significant weight. It, it's quite interesting, actually, if you actually think about all the guitars mm. that are made out of those weird things. They always go for the strat with the with the whammy. Yeah, you noticed? yeah. So there's <laughs> as much cut out of the body as possible. Yeah, yeah. make it half. Make it half the thickness. Make it only like twenty five mil thick or something, and then do two sheets and make it into a three three five. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Thinking about it, Mickey's cousins do uh, resin flooring. Like that's that's their full time occupation. They make like custom resin, like stone inlay resin floors. The cogs are turning. <laughs> you want a stone made guitar? Yeah, but stone and <laughs> resin and like light stones, so it looks really cool and like pads the weight out a bit. So it might only weigh 13 pounds or 14 pounds, which I can just about put up with as a bass player because I'm used to being strangled by my instrument. 
That could actually look quite cool. Yeah. Plus most yeah. of most of the straps that I have are three inches wide on you know four inches wide, proper like shoulder pad straps, because I'm used to not really liking it digging into my neck muscles. So yeah, spread Smart. spread the weight out and uh yeah. I mean I started doing that years ago because I had a copy of an Alembic base that weighed a fucking ton. And so I had to get those kind of straps. Otherwise I'd actually have like compression scars on my shoulders after a show. Alembic, you don't hear that name being thrown about very often. No, you don't. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's much more common in the bass world than the guitar world, I, I believe. But a real oh, one yeah. of them was like 10, 12 grand. And this was back in 2002. Uh, so like yeah. when nobody was doing that. And so, yeah, we, we got a Fernandez copy of an Alembic. Uh, me and my dad, we found one because it was supposed to all be destroyed in the 70s in a big lawsuit thing. Yeah. And yeah, we found one and it was real and it had an XLR out on the base. <laughs> but it it was a five pin XLR that went to a, a separate unit that split the base and neck pickups out separately. It was incredible. Interesting. Yeah. So what the, as in each individual string? Each individual pickup went out to its own separate isolated output. Okay, yeah. So you could, re, so you could amp them separately. And I, I did that That's on a few shows, but yeah, I started getting like, um, yeah, bruising and cut scars on my shoulder. So I started getting big straps to take the weight. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why when I started playing six string bass, everyone's like, that's really big. And I'm like, eh, nothing new to me. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's time everybody for Behringer Corner. There we go. Um, so Behringer has given us an update on their basically Roland 909 drum machine. And apparently there's some sort of MIDI sync issue. So they're taking forever. Uh, but I'm kind of excited to get something like this because having physical drum machines could be quite inspiring for the electro type stuff. And yeah, they're going to be cheap. So why not? Give it a go. In fact, actually, I've been really wanting to pick up the Dimension from Clark Technic. I know it's technically a different company, but we well, yeah, it company. is, but it isn't. Um, yeah. Well, I've got the TC Dimension pedal, and that's really nice. It sounds good enough to my ears that it's it's well worth having a look at so yeah the, the the boss dimension pedal the waza the waza one was really good as well yeah but the price leap for the boss dimension pedal is quite high it's actually more expensive than the clark technic one isn't it yeah in theory it yeah. is yeah although if you do like that sound i probably would go for the boss one because it's stereo in stereo out and a much smaller form factor so you may as well very true but yeah, um, there's more in Behringer Corner this week. Um, Behringer has revealed that they're making a sequential profit clone, essentially, with no keys and extra voices. And I do love the uh, the profit sounds. Big 80 synths. Massive 80 synth tones. And so if these are even nearly affordable, they're going to be under $600. I might end up with one of these. So that looks interesting. It, like I, uh, one of those things that I've not explored with very much is synths, mm. like actual physical synths. Right. I've I've owned but, a couple of vintage synths, but they're a real pain to keep working. I had a DX7 Mark One for a long time, but the plugin sounded identical, so eventually I just gave up. Just me. So yeah, that was the news, and back to talking about general stuff we've had lots and lots of questions in chat so let's plow through a few of them shall we now a uh, question from scott uh would a guy with limited fret hand mobility uh because um scott has nerve damage in his hand uh, i know that much would he still find riff hard helpful it might actually help with the with alleviating the nerve damage because most of it's from the right hand anyway um but it's again you need the syncopation between the left and right hand so most of it is based off it's almost like drum rudiments so imagine building up speed endurance and all of that stuff through different tailored exercises so i would say that there's nothing wrong with giving it a go and seeing if it helps um i find that it you know it works for me it works for a lot of other people but it depends just how severe 
the nerve damage is in the hand that's, without being a doctor it's kind of difficult for me to say but give it a try for one month and see what you think and i'll obviously be there to give you a hand yeah john will be there to hold your left hand <laughs> yes awesome let's have a look uh what have we got in chat because i did have up on screen earlier hold your questions until now now is the time get those questions in ladies and gentlemen uh oh here's one that we've been talking about recently off camera since 42 gear street uh question would rock wool be better than foam yes uh but i'll carry on the question uh to build a small vocal booth in the corner of my studio aim is to keep the noise in and not upset the neighbors neighbors when yelling the Neubers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> then the Neumann Neubers. <laughs> Just um, make sure you've got air gaps. Like, even though Rockwall is good at alleviating some noise, it's the air gap that really helps. So if you wanted to build something in the corner of your room, make sure there's an air gap between the wall and then whenever you start your rock wall. And if you can get a mass-loaded vinyl hanging in between that air gap, even better. <laughs> yes he says having some of <laughs> but yeah i mean if if the aim is to separate your sound from you from next door honestly good luck uh because um sound travels and the only thing that stops sound traveling is mass mass meaning heavy stuff foam is going to do nothing for that um something that like yeah me and john we were at 42 gear street together and we traveled there and back so we spent a lot of time talking recently and one of the things that came up was was this and i was saying my philosophy on sound in rooms was like split it into three you low you medium and you high high you can affect just by changing the surface of things so like foam changes the surface of something like if something was perfectly shiny you stick a piece of foam on high end isn't going to reflect uh mids can be done with things like rock wool because that's kind of medium thickness and kind of squishy low end good luck you may as well stick boulders out of mass loaded vinyl as john says because yeah the only it way needs to... to be hanging it needs to be hanging because the whole point of it hanging is is that it takes the energy off the Yes, and then the sound, and then doesn't carry the vibration onto the next thing. Quite right. Exactly. It actually, I actually think more than what you're saying with mass is actually decoupling for bass. Anyway, yeah, like having like floating <laughs> and untouching bits of the room. Like that's why people spend all this money to float their floor and make sure that the walls aren't touching in any sort of way. And not like I mean, the best way to think about it is when you hit your guitar. You hit the string and then it rattles through the entire guitar because of certain points that's touching it. Mm. It's the same thing for the bottom end um, in a room. If you've got any part of your room that you're playing a bass amp in and it's touching your corridor, then it's going to go through to the corridor, mm. even at quiet volumes. It's 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 so yeah. Every everything's in everything is intertwined. I think it's it's a bit of column A, a bit of column B. Because like the, with the guitar example, why do semi-hollow or hollow guitars make more noise than fully solid bodies? It's because they have less mass. Um, coupled with the whole coupling thing and soundboard theory, and there is more to it, definitely. But I don't know if you've ever, ever had two of the same model of guitar and one's made of a lighter wood, one's made of a denser wood. The lighter wood one will always sound louder. Yep. Because the less mass means that the sound's not being absorbed. It has more ability to carry on ringing. There's there's so much to it. It's a big conversation that you can uh, you can go down that. But dude, didn't you know that wood doesn't change the tone tonal quality of an electric guitar? <laughs> Apparently, there's no such thing as tone wood. Oh dear, that can't. I. <sighs> I, I let's not let's not go on. To let's this not go okay, too angry. deep in that. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, I mean, my my opinion falls somewhere in the middle, so I'm the worst person to talk to because I'll argue both sides and end up coming out with no clear answer. <laughs> <laughs> um. So questions. I had a question came up in our Discord specifically for you, John. 
Uh, join our Discord, by the way, and when our guests come on every week, you get first shout for questions, and I always make sure we ask them. Uh, so, one from Marty. Uh, uh, so he says, uh, John Brown, a very formal introduction. Uh, you are right to have Riff Hard as a great tool to strengthen rhythm playing. There can't be enough sources. How did you learn slash develop those techniques in the past? Master of Puppets, Metallica. <laughs> just over and over and over <laughs> yeah no that was definitely sort of the beginning of it but um actually i got psoriasis on my hands when i was 16 so i was forced to change my entire guitar sort of perspective and when i was bending strings and doing vibrato and all that it just my hands were getting torn to shreds um so it kind of was like hearing the sugar metallica ackle as well from tesseract and then sort of the fact that I couldn't do lead playing anymore. It was kind of a blessing in disguise hmm. um, because I was really bad at rhythm until that point. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's interesting. So you then focused in on, well, I can't do this thing. What can I do? Exactly. It was just like, what doesn't hurt my hands to play? Um, obviously, it's different than <clears> the <throat> question we answered earlier about you know the nerve damage. But I guess in a way, it was just trying to find a way of working around the problem that you have rather than just giving up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Improvise, adapt, um, overcome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Destroy, erase, improve. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, what, what, yeah, that's, yeah, we were talking a couple of weeks ago about this and that psoriasis. Um, not many people seem to know this, but for the last 20 years or so of Rush's big career, Alex Lifeson. Um, had psoriasis and would have to warm up for like an hour before every show because of, of that but yeah it must have been an absolutely grueling thing for all the solo work that, he, that, that he's known for exactly and the same with um, a guy called Sean Lane I know that some people will be familiar with him mm. he is an obscenely good guitar player but he also had psoriasis on his hands Right. Um, and I really don't know how he did what he did with that but mm. it's pretty common i mean three percent of the population has it they don't get it on their hands then if they play guitar then they're uh exceedingly lucky <laughs> mm. yeah it's always uh look at things from a positive perspective yeah I, mean, I just i could still play so you know um i don't i'm not necessarily angry about it in fact if anything it helped me develop to where i got so that's always a positive thing mm. yeah can oh. we call it tone material tone yes, material like tone paint <laughs> <laughs> oh god the whole thing about nitrocellulose you can get oh god you can get right down a, a rabbit hole um so here we go um what else have we got questions i saw a few come up uh fev favorite piece of equipment that you own my favorite piece of equipment is definitely the pod xt it has to be because I've had it the longest out of anything in here. <laughs> As we know, the, the longest is the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, there's a really funny message just there. I can see it and it's amazing. You got to read it out. You got <laughs> oh, it. Oh, from uh, Idle Wire. Yes. I, yeah. yeah, so that is, that's actually a good question. Uh, I'd love to know the most shocking thing John has seen when touring. Uh, we supported Idlewild when younger. The lead singer came in our room, pissed up the walls, said good luck, and walked out. That is absolutely incredible. I can't top that. He held the world in his arms. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, most shocking thing. Tours are pretty boring, really, usually, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's normally just everyone bored on their phones. Yeah. I mean, I've not seen anything like that. I mean, someone pissing up the walls or, yeah, I've never seen anything like that. Um, no, I'm sorry. I'm completely blank right now. <laughs> Maybe another time. I'll have to have a think about that one. There's probably definitely something. Moment like probably that just been throws you for blocked. a loop, doesn't it? It really <laughs> does, yeah. <laughs> I mean, when I used to do a lot of touring, really, I, I kind of stopped touring in 2006, 2007, so people weren't really on the phones then, really, at all, apart from maybe playing Snake. 
Um, yeah. But people would just kind of sit there and warm up and do the typical and the drummer would be tapping away in the corner and everyone would be screaming at them to shut up. I'm actually trying to remember what we did before phones for entertainment on tour and I just can't I can't think of what it was because yeah must have been so bored I mean I, I, I the first tour I ever did we actually um, had to use maps to get to the venues wow because it was pre Tom Tom you know um, yeah yeah so um, oh I um, I'm trying to think cause... like. Hey, um, Chernobyl Studios just said PlayStation, but we had an old Royal Mail van. Yeah, no PlayStation <laughs> in that. No PlayStation in that. And then obviously, I mean, was there any... I mean, there was like PS Vita, you know, um, maybe, but I didn't have one. I'm trying to think what I did. Mostly what I did then is I had uh, a, not a Game Boy, but the light that you used to put on a Game Boy, you know, the kind of external lights that you would get. Yeah, of course. And I would yeah. stick that on a book and I'd just sit, sit in the van and read a book. <laughs> I was the weird kid in the back who would just be sat reading books. <clears throat> I definitely didn't. I'm just trying to... I mean, obviously we had la we had laptops and um, watched films and stuff, but I generally can't think of what entertainment was. Probably just drank beer, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I did a lot of that. I didn't actually drive until I'd pretty much stopped touring. <laughs> Typical bass player. <laughs> but yeah, I, I used to do a lot of that. We'd have a couple of cases of beer in the van and then uh, they wouldn't be there by the time we got there. All the bottles would be filled up with some other substance that was not beer. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I certainly haven't done some of the hardcore touring that you have. Tell us some of the bands that you've toured with, John, for anybody who's not particularly familiar with your touring history. Um with monuments uh we've toured with devon townsend and animals as leaders periphery tesseract um who else have we toured with uh <laughs> it's gone blank again i mean that's that's a fair <laughs> few to begin with uh yeah and, uh scale the summit um glass cloud polyphia with, <laughs> um their first ever tour they were supporting us mm. um who else have we played with? Contortionist. Yeah. Uh, my Off mate Chris is in chat. He says that uh, he played a show with you early on. Uh, at 50, yeah, I saw 50, that. Yeah, yeah, 53 Degrees in Preston. Uh, what an absolute... Uh, can I swear here? Yeah. Just, yeah. just to explain how bad that venue is. Oh, I know how bad that place is. It's a <laughs> shit tip amongst shit tips. But I do remember the show um, pretty well, actually. Cool. Um I mean, it's a pretty unforgettable place, really, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. <laughs> Wipe your feet on the way out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I just remember because um, obviously that tour was quite short with Dead Letter Circus. There was only like maybe 12 shows. Right. Um, um, that's another band we toured with, actually, Dead Letter Circus. We've toured with Carnival as well. I just remember. Oh, that. yes. Um, but yeah, that was a, that was a fun tour because obviously uh, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of Dead Letter Circus. So it was almost like just touring with you know a band you love yeah and it's not to say that i haven't loved all the bands that i've toured with but dead letter i was a massive fan of before we went on tour with them mm. so that um but yeah i remember that show very very well good backstage actually at 53 degrees from what i remember there's quite a lot of rooms yes um there's quite a lot of little I'm... hovels <laughs> yeah but i remember getting a particularly decent rider that day actually <laughs> it's amazing that was, what you that remember what that must have been 2013. Yeah. It was like seven years ago, I think. Yeah. And another significant part of that tour was it, I slipped over on stage in Glasgow and I couldn't move my right hand Ooh. for about a day. Oh, dear. I slipped onto it. Yeah. And I couldn't finish the set. Yeah. It was quite, uh, quite a weird day. I was quite scared that day. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not good. I've I've had a couple of times in my life when an arm's gone completely numb and there's there's nothing more frightening for someone who plays instruments and that's their thing. Yeah. That's uh yeah, yeah it's not a good feeling. Yeah, um Martin chat asked, did you actually get to play with Carnival? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did a whole tour with them in two thousand and fifteen. Ah. So it um the London show was at the Roundhouse, which was ridiculous. Mm. Um, 
yeah, we played. Uh, where else we play? Switzerland, France, Germany. Yeah, it was about two and a half, three week tour. That one. Yeah, it was great. Um, amazing band, obviously, Carnival. Yeah, I mean, it, it does suck being away from home for so long. A stretch, though, doesn't it? There was one time you were telling me that it was like six months where you were home for like a day. Uh, it was it, it was about four, three to four weeks in that period. I think I was at home total. Total. Yeah. Um, yeah. So left in July, got back December twentieth, and I think I was at home for about four weeks, scattered within that period of time. It was four tours back to back, and then um, in the January I went to Nam, but I ended up staying in Los Angeles for six weeks, and then going straight from LA to Soundwave, and then from Soundwave Festival we flew back to England to play on the Carnival tour. So. <laughs> Yeah, and that was within like an eight-month period. Mm. So yeah, I was away quite a lot in that eight-month period. Um, very intense. Yeah, that's one way of putting it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how, how do you how, how do you even deal with a tour that long? Do you just keep getting more new band T-shirts and <laughs> just throw away the old ones? <laughs> it, you it, you kind of forget what it's like to be at home. So, because it's if you think about it, it, it it's it, you know, it, it's. It, I'm not saying that it's not awesome. It is awesome, but it kind of turns into Groundhog Day a little bit because it's the same thing every single day. The only difference, because I mean, people say, "Oh, you've been to all these amazing places," but chances are most bands haven't seen anything. Mm. They've seen the venue. They might have seen a hotel down the street, and they may have seen where they went to go and eat. Yeah. But when it comes to the, like the states, for example, the drives are so long. Yeah. The generally you just don't have the time to see anything unless obviously you're in a touring bus if you're in a bus then you can probably get to the venue like three or four hours before you have to load in if you got text that's sick as well because then you don't have to load in and you can go and see some more stuff for a few hours yeah um but when you're in a band that's touring in a 15 seat a passenger van and you're driving yourselves then the drives are 10 hours and your driver needs to sleep as well then generally you're not going to get much time to see anything at all. I mean, I've been, I've never seen the Grand Canyon and I've been to the States like 12 times. Yeah. Well, yeah. Su- suppose you're not going to get, yeah, you're not going to get enough time during that day, even even if you had extra time to go out, see it, get back. If you had suppose a day Suppose you'd have off. to be very lucky in a way to have a, a day's break in between two shows to be able yeah, to I'd, do something like that. I mean, occasionally there has been times when there's been <clears throat> days off and we get to see something like Soundwave is a perfect example of that. Um, Soundwave, rest in peace. Um, it was conducted over two weekends. So you actually have five days in the middle, ah. to, which was pretty, pretty great. But we were in Brisbane for that time. So we got to see quite a lot of Brisbane. Uh, Dead Letter Circus were recording their third album. So we got to go see them do that um got to see surface paradise um and a bunch of other stuff but it's really really rare that you really get to see anything like the last australia tour we did um mm. with new zealand we did new zealand two shows then flew to australia had the rest of that day off yeah. and then six flights and six shows over six days oh so it's a flight every morning to a show that evening and by the end of that, that that was hands down the most exhausted I've ever been, I think, because it was like we'd get to the hotel at like two o'clock in the morning after packing up mm. um, and then have to be awake at five or six o'clock in the morning to get on the flight. <laughs> and then no time to sleep during the day either. So it was uh, it was pretty it was pretty intense. Absolutely. Uh, I recommend having a day off. Yeah. <laughs> no, no surprise that the biggest bands insist on doing two days maybe three maximum before they have a day off yeah that is <laughs> that is the smartest way especially um like you know depending on the style of the band i mean if you look at a band like architects it's like that must be incredibly difficult to scream and sing like that yeah for one to two hour sets for longer than three days in a row yeah um and then obviously you know the the bigger the bigger bands like metallica and stuff they're doing two to three hour sets a night yeah I always look at the the tour itinerary when Dream Theater go on tour, uh, being a, a bit of a mega fan, and it's it's usually two days, three at the tops. But when they're doing an evening with Dream Theater, it's a three and a half hour show, and that's not a three and a half hour show of lounge jazz. 
That's a three and a half <laughs> show, hour show where most of it is intensely technical. God yeah. only knows how they even make it through a show that long. I mean, I've played in you know, wedding bands, cover bands, and done three, three and a half hour sets, and I always come off dripping with sweat. But some of the songs in there are fairly chilled out. A lot of them yeah. aren't, but none of them are like Dance of Eternity or anything that intense. <laughs> I'd say that for most bands, it's down to the vocalist. Mm. that's generally what it's down to vocals i mean if you think about it every single time you're singing for that amount of time yeah you're just doing damage to your vo your vocal cords you know from being used it's like going to the gym yeah like you need to have those days off otherwise you're just going to wreck your muscles and it's the same for vocals i mean guitar you could probably get away with playing six days a week and you'd probably be fine mm. but even then something like dream theater then john probably wants a day where he just has like where he's not trying to reach light speed you know like the soloing as i am or something yeah <laughs> well funny talking about that like because i used to do um the three three and a half hour shows as the main vocalist uh but it wasn't particularly aggressive but i've been finding and i'm just rooting around here um as i'm getting a little older i'm finding it's a little more difficult to do that so i've just bought the zen of screaming that's going to oh, be yeah. my new watch for the next couple of weeks i'm going to really get into this there's some like proper warm up exercises and techniques, and apparently it will help me to become yeah one with the aggression without coughing and spluttering and being in tears afterwards. Nearly everyone I've toured with, the vocalist does the exercises from the Zen of Screaming. No shit. Yeah, it's uh, she's great. What's her name again? I Melissa Cross. Melissa Cross. That's it. Yeah, uh, I mean she uh, she taught you know quite a lot of the big vocalists mm. there, there is a list on the back and at first you read it going ah this is marketing guff it's like andrew wk all that remains every time i die lamb of god apparently no they're, they're, they're quite serious that she uh she knows what she's doing she really does i'm surprised you actually haven't bought it till now you're 34 years old right yes i am and you haven't bought that dvd yet Funnily, well, funnily enough, up, I've never seen myself as a screamer, but the more and more I want to do it, the more I'm finding that I would do it a little bit when I was in my 20s and get away with it, but now I can't. If I, if I do one aggressive song in a set, I can't speak for two days. Yeah, you need that zen of screaming because you're screaming all wrong. I, I, evidently so. Yeah. So yeah, that's where also just my general singing is starting to suffer. So um, I'll be uh, looking at that. I mean, in the past, I've done proper warm up routines with vocal teachers, but it's not something I've done for a long time, and I really should get back to it. But yeah, it's uh, it's something that I'm getting interested in again because it's not been my main focus for a while. So yeah, always room to self improve. Exactly. Just, always, always room for improvement. Just never enough time in the day. But hey, that's a whole there different isn't. problem. <laughs> that is, yes. Just seeing a question actually from Marty, just saying you do need to put a strip of some sort in front of those LEDs. Oh yeah, and yeah, that. I've I've actually got the strips, but I'm just far too busy to sort it out right yeah. now. I need um, to put the LEDs in front of the strips. I've just just bought some <laughs> for my studio. <laughs> there you go. Ah, you're copying me, mate. Yeah, absolutely. I'm <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah totally didn't order him before i'd seen your studio honest <laughs> oh no it's all good like i i just copied it from uh google <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, yeah my, mine are going behind my studio console just to give it a bit of a back glow kind of thing yeah but yeah, it, whether that works or not we'll see yeah it would definitely work for sure it just adds a little bit of mm. you know color into it doesn't it really more than anything yeah Just literally yeah makes it look a little bit less flat a bit less boring exactly exactly i've, I've just got the whole depth of field thing down at the studio I've, I've realized that even this 25 mil lens that i just got is is no match for my full frame zeiss lens and a speed booster that just oh yes it's the... is it a really narrow uh field of yeah, f one point four. You've on, even on this camera, you've got a depth of field of a centimeter. It's beautiful <laughs> until until you move ever so slightly. Yeah, and it's completely manual focus. So you either just sit there like a statue, oh. or you stop down a bit. <laughs> That's crazy. So you, basically, if you used it for what you're doing now, you would focus on the end of your mic. 
Yes. And maybe you probably wouldn't even be in focus. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. I'd be out of focus. I'd be in focus there and out here. I mean, I'm already a little soft there, but it auto focuses. But yeah, because that has no manual focus whatsoever, you decide on your frame and then you just don't move. <laughs> exactly. It's the same as my Sigma lens, but that's got a really wide sort of depth of field. Um, like it seems to be more than I remember, but maybe it's because I'm not up close. Maybe that's what it is. Mm. Marty's yeah. saying, yeah, those those soup, those amps at the back look really boring. Yeah, I mean, if you ever get bored of those amps, I'm sure I could find space for them somewhere. <laughs> and they, well, I think it looks great, to be honest. I do, but I know Marty. He's, he's one of my mods in chat. He's uh, he's got a sense of humour. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. But oh yes, oh, I'm I'm getting stiff in this chair. I've been sat pretty much in this chair for four solid days now, and starting to resemble the shape of this chair. Um, I think Is... I'll be in the studio tomorrow, so thank God. So I get to sit in a different chair. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like me, like to me, you need a air on chair because it doesn't feel like you're sitting per se. Well, it's a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, it, it's just that over time I get comfier and comfier and comfier until I lock in a position that I shouldn't be in. It's, ah, yeah, it's slouch. Bad, yeah, it's bad form, so I, I keep making sure that I uh, unslouch. But yeah. I don't know. I've been doing a lot of editing recently, so it's uh, yeah, the chair. The chair. <laughs> but yeah, I think I will be investing in some nice chairs at some point soon because I need it. You should definitely do it because you your entire like what you do requires you sitting down. Mm. <laughs> so I mean, I could yeah. just reframe the cameras and stand. That's not the worst idea, actually. <laughs> just work. And you could also get a, a standing desk. Oh god, not with the console I've got. That's never moving. It weighs as much as three men. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, Marty's right in chat. I do have like a custom thing that I do to my chairs is that I only install one of the armrests. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, because you want to be able to play your instrument, right? Yes, but I also want something to lean on when I'm feeling lazy. <laughs> it makes sense, yeah. I mean, the good thing about the air on is you can move the them out the way oh do they click downwards yeah depending on how fat your legs are see mine are quite fat so they <laughs> almost reach over them <laughs> well, it sounds like i, I i'd be in a similar position because i've got short fat stumpy legs for my size yeah. so yeah there you go you see you'll be completely fine <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh no mm. i got those thick thighs it's uh <laughs> it can be a problem <laughs> But yeah, uh, oh no, if I have retractable arms, that's worse because I'll forget that I've retracted it and I'll go to lean and it'll be like the Dell Boy in uh, Only Fools and Horses routine. I'll just go to lean and just fall off. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's see if there's any more questions. Yeah. Uh, it's just about time to let you go and do your thing. Eat some food. Yes. I'm going to be eating very late tonight as a uh, 40 minute drive home. Mm. Makes it 10 o'clock. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, one last question then from Scott. Uh, how was the experience with AL doing the Ultimate Metal Boot Camp series? Oh, amazing. Me and AL are really, really good friends. Um, which one was the Metal Boot Camp, though? Um, that was so long ago that I can't remember, but AL is actually one of my partners at Riff Hard. So he is one of the people behind the vision of it. Um, <clears throat> but don't ask him when the last time he played guitar was. I just throw uh, something at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think he's actually started playing again, which is cool. Well, that man works so hard, it'll probably feel like it's been about three days. It's true, actually. Yeah, I, I that guy is busy. Yeah, I, I think I think I'm busy, and then I just look at Al, and it's like, no, nah, I'm I'm not busy enough. Yeah, he's he's a <laughs> one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. He's yeah. very busy. <laughs> but no, like, AL's really great at what he does. Um, yeah. Always wants it to be the best it can be. Yeah. You... Um, mm. Yeah, but the Metal Boot Camp one, I think it's the one that we did in LA at the, was it Quasimodo? When we re-recorded Quasimodo with a noop. I've um, seen the trailer from that. I think that was the Metal In fact, I'm just going to have a look at it quickly, because I think that that's what it was. 
Yeah. See, I knew which song you meant. I've been listening up to Monument stuff recently. It's good stuff. Oh, yeah? Yes. I've been taking all my mixed notes going, well, this is crap, that's crap, this is shit. No, no, I haven't. <laughs> ah, wait you... a minute. Yeah, this this is it. Recording Metal with A.L. Levy. Metal Boot Camp. Um, yeah, I think that this is the... <clears throat> Which one is it? I don't know. Uh... He says that's that's the one on Creative Live. That's what Scott says. There is three on Creative Live that I maybe two, but I'm pretty sure that's the one where we recorded the whole song. Um, I'm just gonna watch the trailer. Yeah, that's that one. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's Quasimodo. Yeah, that was uh, that was fun. Um, the uh, live room, however, had a massive 250 hertz bump. Oh dear! Which is quite interesting. Um, it's apparently commonly known. What, what's the name of the? Is uh, clear? What's the name of the studio that it was at? I can't remember. But no, it's fun. Where, um, where were you roughly? L.A. You say? Yeah, it was L.A. So it was after the Nam show in two thousand and sixteen, I think, maybe fifteen. Um, when we did that, not somewhere like Hit Factory or Avatar or. No, no. They're I, both in New York. Y- yes, of course they are. Duh. Um, <laughs> Brain, no, it was, it's something fire. lake something lake studio um i want to say it's clear lake um but yeah it was it was a good time so um it was pretty easy i mean like obviously it would have been more difficult if it was a song that we were writing there but because we'd already recorded the song it was fairly straightforward yeah cl- um, clear lake yeah yeah it was just um just repetition <laughs> <laughs> like any recording session really isn't it Rep- yeah rep- repeating all the time do it again do it again, do it again, tune up, do it again, tune up, do it again. But the good thing about um, about that particular session was that the, there was a huge crew for camera, audio, um, and everything else, food, the whole thing. I think total there's probably like 10 people operating everything. Nice. Um, so it was like super easy yeah. comparatively to, you know, any video session that me and you do, Adam, because we're doing like... 10 people's jobs yeah god yeah uh, if, if try to it would make <laughs> my day if i was working i could just hold my hand up and go coffee please and there would be one there <laughs> it, it would make my day if someone would actually put me in focus while i'm sat on my chair <laughs> yes you just need like a, one of those uh grabbers you know the long finger longer things just grab them <laughs> they, they've, they've got apps for this now adam <laughs> what for manual lenses <laughs> not for manual lenses though no i'm surprised there's not a device actually that converts well i guess there is isn't there um i've, um, I've got a couple actually but like yeah funnily enough um i have uh one of the dji gimbals the ronin sc and it's and it has the autofocus thing. it has yeah like manual focus rings and a motor and have you seen if you've got the ronin then you should check out that um that thing it's made by, uh, I posted it in uh, the chat the other day, and it basically converts so that you can use Blackmagic Design pocket cameras with the software directly, and it does the pan and tilt from a Blackmagic Design Atom. Oh, oh, right. Oh, that's, uh, I that's... can't remember the name of the company, um, but you should check it out. That's then interesting. You can, so basically, your camera then becomes a PTZ. Mm camera that you can move and all that sort of stuff yeah that is interesting because i've been doing things like uh, ptz and pan tracking and stuff with the gh5 but just through using the ronin and it's a bit of a pain in the backside using it through the phone software to be honest yeah because you have to mount the phone on top and then it becomes too heavy you don't have to i have learned you only have to mount the phone on top if you're doing the active track uh, okay. which is a cool feature and but that takes more messing around the active track is you know where you do that and it it tracks an object itself which is a really cool feature but if you're literally just doing like a pan from here to here to here to here you don't need to mount it it's just you're just sending instructions but it's still just a mess around yeah then you've got to mount the gimbal on a tripod or something and it almost <laughs> seems to defeat the object yes yeah, it's a, it is a long way around, isn't it, with the gimbal? The gimbal's like really useful for a lot of things, but surely having something like this big instead as a PTZ would probably be better rather than something that's like this. 
Yes. Well, there is Edel Crone stuff that does that, but then Henning was complaining loudly about all that kind of stuff. It's also very, very expensive. It's all expensive, mate. <laughs> There's no getting away from it. If you want to do anything cool that's not some cheap Chinese knockoff, it's all expensive. One thing that would probably be useful, actually, is learning how to program Raspberry Pis. I've actually been thinking this over the last couple of months. Where's my pie? Like, why well, I've not tried it yet, but then it's just something else to fall down a rabbit hole with, you know? Oh, it really is. I've got a Raspberry Pi 3 right lying around here somewhere. And the things I've got that to do have been very cool. Like, I used it as a web server for a while, but yep. I, then separately I used it to play all my retro arcade games on the TV. Uh, I then separately uh, reinstalled stuff to use it, like, as a as a firewall for the internet in here. Um, yep. I've, I've used it for so many things it, they're, they're so versatile but I just can't stick with using it for one thing because then I'll have to buy another one and another one and another one so imagine imagine programming um, the Raspberry Pi so that you could actually do the PTZ movements and stuff like that um, which I think would be entirely possible oh they yeah have, you know. I mean you can connect an Arduino up to it and that would then do anything you need. Arduinos will do anything like that with voltage relays. I've actually got an old CCTV camera lens which I need to get up and running which uses 12 volts but it does it like it's it's a f1.4 but it's something like 8 mil to 150 mil. And oh. yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But it's all controlled with like PTZ, like the same control stuff as PTZ, but inside the lens, and then you PTZ on the camera as well. And interesting, it, yeah. But like, um, I've been trying to find a way to do it, and I'd need a twelve volt relay on an Arduino, and then connect it to a Raspberry Pi. And I'm like, well, I'd love to do this, but I don't have the time. I don't have the time or the patience. Yeah. Well, I've, I've got the patience, um, but then kind of you look up when you've succeeded and you go, why are there birds singing? Oh, it's 6 a.m. Ah, right. <laughs> I should sleep now. Well, that's the next I've, I've day not, wasted. I've definitely not done that for a while, but I'm no. pretty sure that some of those days are probably going to happen again soon. Yeah. I mean, especially because I've got the the, the baby, I've got Ivy. Um, I can't really do that anymore. Because, yeah, that's that's the thing that goes out the window when you have kids is you can't just on a whim just stay up till 6 a.m. Because then you get <laughs> wait, you, you will get woken up at 7.30 a.m. whether you like it or not. And that's a rough day. <laughs> it's quite funny that, that you said the baby I've got. <laughs> the way that you phrased that just then was quite funny. <laughs> but, yeah, I was trying to find a way to <laughs> toddler. I was trying to find a way to word it properly. That's not like I've just had a baby. <laughs> yeah. Terrible twos. Yeah, oh as well. God, she she's lovely, but she's also a little shit. Um yes. which yeah, she is too. Um I spent most of today either holding her and dancing around with her to the new pendulum single, which is cool, by the way. I need to check that out. I've always never minded pendulum at all. So Yeah. It does sound exactly like old pendulum though, which is a little bit like meh. Um so the first pendulum single in ten years, and it sounds like it's been three months. Okay. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I mean, if you think about it, when I listen to a band, I listen to that band for that sound. So it being the same is probably a good thing for a lot of people. Yeah, I I do like bands that stretch out a bit. Uh, I mean, oh, you mean it's like exactly? Yes, that's what I mean. I mean, literally, it sounds like a bonus track off the last album, which is fine. I mean, it's not bad. It's a good single. I've, I've listened to it six times today, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, but like my favorite, like I listened to Pendulum back when only the first album, Hold Your Color, was out, and that was a classic, straight ahead drum and bass album. It sounded like it had been produced in Reason, and it was it was what it was. And then the second album came out, and it had a band on it in Silico. Yeah, and that's one of my favorite albums of all time because it's one of the. It's like here's a genre that I kind of like, but is getting a bit stale. Let's throw a band in like that thing that I like and go bang. And it sounded a bit different, and a lot of people complained. And yeah. I was a massive fan because it's like yes, a band can do drum and bass. I am inspired. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't. I, I said I don't mind it, and it always. It was kind of like I don't know. It was just heavier sort of electronic music mm. 
So, yeah. I also like the the early Skrillex stuff. Uh, yeah. un- until that got a little bit repetitive. And Everything gets repetitive if you listen to it too much. Yeah, I guess. But then I can listen to the early albums of say, Pendulum or Skrillex over and over because there's a nostalgia factor. Exactly. I find it difficult to listen to new material from them that sounds derivative because it doesn't have the freshness, but it also doesn't hold the nostalgia factor. Exactly. I think that's why we like, you know, why we go back to these old songs and we listen to them. It might not necessarily be that they were the best songs ever that we think they are. It might just be that we hold on to them because it reminds us, reminds us of a point in time. Mm. Quite interesting when you think about that, isn't it? <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of that goes on. It's funny, yeah. what, one of my favourite bands uh, is Incubus, and they're one of the few bands that I've really stuck with right through the years, and they keep changing and changing. But... I haven't <clears> listened <throat> to them since the album, what was it, Light Grenades? Yes. One of my, that was the last one. One of my favourite albums. But then the stuff since that has been different again. Uh, and I haven't liked any of it. <clears throat> Which is fine. I mean, not everyone's going to, but you know, for, for me, they're the band that the new stuff is still likable. Like, I was a massive Rush fan, and the last three or four Rush albums, I just didn't get on with at all. Like, the last one I thought was quite good. Yeah, I, I just thought it was a bit wishy-washy because Alex Lifeson just retreated into his room of reverb like he, he always does. Mm. And yeah, Reverb's good though. <laughs> in moderation, he says one of my favorite albums being Power Windows by Rush, which is all reverb. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the nostalgia thing again, because like I listened to the live, uh, they did a live VHS for the for the younger people at home. That's like a DVD, but in a large black brick. And it's nothing <laughs> like a DVD. Well, it plays video. <laughs> it's got tape in it, literally. Yes. Tape. Yeah. And when you when you want to watch that tape again, you actually rewind have to wait it. for it to rewind. <laughs> yes. But yeah, that particular de- that that show is called a show of hands, and I, as a child, broke two VHS players and three VHS tapes with that. Ow. By watching it over and over and over again and the rewinding getting stuck in the mechanisms, I watched uh, yes. I watched it that many times I wore the tape out twice and took two machines with it. <laughs> I miss I miss having to rewind tape. There was something quite cool about it, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. But yeah, I had a strange childhood that I had two obsessions. Thomas the Tank Engine, which is to be expected when you are three. I didn't have that. No? What'd you have? What was I obsessed with? What show was it? I don't think I really did obsess with any of the shows. I, I mean, computer games, definitely. Mm. But no, and what was the second thing? Rush. <laughs> so Thomas the Tank Engine and Rush. Yeah, if, 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 if anything. Weird. But that, if you extrapolate it out to a 34-year-old, it kind of makes sense. It's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of what it was that I was like on TV. I don't remember really, not when I was really young anyway. No? But no. Um, I mean, a couple of years later, I was obsessed with Sonic the Hedgehog and the Sega Mega Drive. But yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, from for me, that was age seven. Right. That's when I got the Mega Drive. But I had the Master System before that. So ah. I'd already played like Alex the Kid and sonic and all those games on that right um, and i was completely obsessed with playing that we had a commodore 64 and it was crap so oh no that was great i had an amstrad cpc 464 oh, i got no. it when i was three and i and that you had to load games with tape yeah I, I, yeah but yeah my commodore 64 it didn't have a disc machine it was tape only yeah and yeah so, but it was just you know, it was crap you thought it was crap. Oh, I did I at the time. Um, now that I'm older and I know what games are good, um, I, I've got hold of really good games for it. But back then, I don't. I just don't think we had anything good for it. So my experience was less than enthusiastic. Did you ever play the game series Dizzy? Yes. Yeah, that was. You were the, the egg. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Yeah, I remember that. But I didn't have Dizzy because that was an Amstrad only thing, really. 
and also um i remember calling up the hotline do you oh, when you used to have to call hotlines the, for games? The tip line. You 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 were yeah. you you were allowed to call the tip line. Wow. Only only like four times or something. I because I screamed at my parents. I think it's like because of the amount of times I had to load this tape. Because right. do you remember like with certain games, if you died, you had to reload the tape. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> I don't think I had um, any games that did that, but that's awful. That's yeah. It, there was one in particular that I remember this one game, and I got to the same point <laughs> every single time, and it was called Dynamite Ducks, and <sighs> I'm still angry thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't take much to make you angry, though, does it, John? You just think about I a mean, thing, the, and <laughs> well, what do you what do you imagine though? Like, you imagine like so this tape. It wasn't like a a one minute waiting for your playstation to load up it was like 10 20 minutes yep um and then you died in exactly the same place that you died last time so then you wait another 20 minutes and then you die in the exact same spot over and over and over it's like <laughs> mm. oh yeah, that's probably why i was an angry kid one thing that we did have for our commodore that kind of defined who i am today is we had this thing oops, it was a terminator 2 cartridge but it also had a music okay. maker game on it yeah and it made some proper like dirty synth sounds and you could control it and actually set it up and play it live. And so I you should I, try it now. Yeah. If I can find it, I should, because the SID chip in the Commodore was badass. And yeah. I would have the TV on full blast, making these like kind of sounds out of the TV as a five year old. <laughs> yep. And yeah, I wonder, yeah, I wonder how much that's bled over into my uh, preference for quite dirty sounds. <laughs> you should uh you should give it a go if you find it oh i'll um i've tried googling it a couple of times and i'm sure it's out there but yeah it was one of the later 64c games that was a pack in with yeah um terminator 2 which was a terrible game because you could only get so far and then it'd just stop ah uh, yes wait a second i played that game where one of them was like a side scrolling like punch but you could only like go like uppercut and then it suddenly became the game where you were being chased by the truck yeah and then there were, and then there were puzzles where you were trying to put the terminator's face back together no maybe i didn't play that game maybe i'm thinking of aliens or something there were loads of games like that at the time but that was the one that yeah, i had and the best thing about the cartridge is you turn the commodore on and it just worked and it was no 20 minute wait for that one. So I played a lot of that game for that reason. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That, that, that'd be the reason too. I mean, when we got the master system, it was like, Oh my God, I can play games in 30 seconds. Yeah. Well, that's it. I think that was the only cartridge I had for the Commodore 64 because cartridges were rare and expensive. What for the Commodore? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, tapes, you could just get a copy off your mate. <laughs> Or at did least, you copy them? Well, my dad did at the time, or my mum did, or they, they knew someone I had no who did. Idea. Yeah, because it, it's literally just audio data, so you can just copy it tape to tape. You're kidding. Nope. Yep, it's straight, it's 8 bit data. If you I... listen to it screeching, it's just zeros and ones. Yeah, that makes sense, actually, doesn't it? So Why there's... did I never do that? Because <laughs> you were a kid and you wouldn't have thought of it. Yeah, it's true. I just didn't as uh, associate the two, you know, with yeah. each other. I think it might have been yeah. my uncle. My uncle was was someone who did a, did a lot of copying at the time, and then for many years afterwards, it was my uncle that 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 got me into Tool because I'd heard about this band Tool through a friend, and he was doing all like copying CDs in two thousand and one. So he's like, "There you go, MP three copy in two thousand and one." Yeah, like, 128 kilobit. In fact, probably yeah. even been 128. I think it might have been 128. It was like primo for the time. Uh, I remember that everyone was always like, you know, when when like Napster and uh, what was that one? Was it Kazoo? Oh, Kazaa, yeah, yeah. Kazaa, that's it. Yeah, when all those were about. And you were like, I need to find a 128 bit of this because it's, if anything less, and it's going to sound terrible. Oh, God. I've it's like. 128 sounds terrible. <laughs> I still got somewhere a copy of the first Audio Slave album in 96 kilobit, and it sounds like it's underwater. <laughs> it's hilarious. You compare it to the CD, and then you listen to that, and the cymbals are going quack, quack rather than crash, crash. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> or, um, oh, man. 
Oh, the other one is um, I've got yeah, I think it's sixty four kilobit because there was this thing called like this MP three, I don't know, like MP three Pro or whatever that was supposed to be higher quality. I've got Bulls on Parade by Rage Against the Machine in sixty four kilobit, and it breaks down and it's got the wah guitar on one side only, and the other yeah, side is artifacting like hell because it's supposed to be on one side only because that's the breakdown is it's just on the left side. But the other side is going <laughs> because the bitrate just can't keep up. So the other side, you can hear all the artifacts bleeding over, and it's the most hilarious thing. Ah, kids these days with their streaming and AAC and M4A, mm-hmm. they they don't know who's on. Old, yeah. you're making us sound old. <laughs> I am old. <laughs> yes, I'm, I am too. I'm taking you with me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, so- Adam. It, I'm gonna have to get going. Yeah, it's time. Have time, drive. For, time for the kids to go to bed. <laughs> it is. But, but no, it's just a drive, and I've got to eat. So I'm not eating yet. So. But yes, John, it has been an honor and a privilege to be able to have you on my podcast and call you a massive dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest. It, it's yeah. it's been much fun, and I'm very grateful for you to come be, come in coming on the podcast. I can't even speak now. And so, yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. It's been a lot of fun. And we'll see you all next week. Next week, we have everybody's favourite sweary uh, southern boy, Mr. Jamie Humphreys, as the guest on the street. On the oh, podcast. he's coming on next week? He is. Ah, that'll be fun. He's got some stories to tell. So everybody come oh, back next does. week for episode 71, where Jamie Humphreys, Brian May's guitarist, uh, Mesa Boogie and Dorsey... We will rock you regular. He will tell you lots of stories. You might want to get a beep on your, uh, so you can beep out and swear. I'm going to get demonetized. I'll just roll with it. (laughs) (laughs) But yes, thank you everybody for tuning in. Thanks again, John. And we'll see everybody next week. See you later. Bye. Bye. Hey everyone. That might be the end of the video, but if you fancy carrying on this conversation, we have a Discord server. Link is in the description. We're also on Patreon, which is something you can really help us with. We also are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Hot Pole Studios. See you there.